Uh, we're going to cover section 1.7 and 3.6 today. And it's going to be mainly about inequalities. So the first thing that we're going to cover is linear inequalities. And what we want to know about linear inequalities is that we're going from the idea of equality or like an equation, and then we're going to something that is dealing with inequalities itself. So, all right, so we're going to cover linear inequalities and what does it mean for something to be linear is to resemble the form of a um, linear equation or the y equals mx plus b type form. So we're going to have something like this where we have a number times x plus b and that is going to be greater than or equal to some other number. Uh, this is just an example to understand the form. So this is going to be the less than or equal to example. Then we're going to have the following where it's going to be just less than, strictly less than zero or less than a number. Then we're going to have the greater than or equal to case and strictly greater than case. So those are the four different scenarios that we're going to be able to see with inequalities. Then let's talk about the different forms uh, that we can expect to see for the solution. So we're going to talk about interval notation. And so it's good to know that <clears throat> there's different syntax for what we're going to say. So for example, if we have the solution set in parentheses, OK? What does it mean for something to be in parentheses? So let's cover that case. Let's try to make a little table. OK, so <clears throat> how do you read this? And this is not a, a point. This is not x, comma y type scenario. It's more of a an interval, right? It's saying from comma to. So it has a an origin and a destination kind of thing, an endpoint. So this means the open interval, that's all that it's saying, right? Is that in parentheses A comma B means the open interval from A to B. Now a little bit more explanation on what it means to use the parentheses or not use the parentheses. So what it means is that from A comma B, this is telling you the solution. And the solution is the values between A and B. So whenever you use parentheses, you're always saying from point A to point B is where my solution is. However, I am not including the point A and the point B. So it gives you a reference point or like a, 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 an idea where to start, but does not include the point exactly that you're writing there. <clears throat> um, this is mainly used for less than or greater than symbols. It doesn't have the equality symbol included here. Okay. So in this situation is where we use the parentheses. Then we have square brackets. And so how do we read this, or what does it mean to us, is the close interval
from A to B. So it's the same thing, except one of them is open, one of them is closed. But I wouldn't really focus on what it means to be open, what it means to be closed. <clears throat> Just understand that they're all telling you my solution set is from this point to the other. And the parentheses or the square brackets are going to tell you what to include or exclude whichever point is on the endpoints, right? So what does this square bracket or close interval tell me with respect to my solution? And it just tells me that the values between A and B, they are part of my solution. And so it includes the endpoints. And we use this when we're talking about greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to. So those two scenarios are the ones that include the square bracket. Then we could have a combination. So we could have parentheses and then end up with a square bracket. So what does that mean? It just means that it's considered a half open interval because one of them is parentheses and the other one is a square bracket. So, and again, it's just saying from one point to the other, right? And so what does that mean uh, with respect to my solution set, right? So what does that include? So the values from or between A and B, right? And in this case, we are excluding A, but we are including B because whichever one is associated with the <clears throat> square bracket is the one that we are including. And whenever we are using the parentheses, it, it means that we're excluding that value. Okay, so that's very important to understand. That's going to help us uh, be able to understand the solution or represent the final solution accordingly, right? Because if we don't know whether the point is included or not, then that's going to make a difference when we are trying to finalize the problem we're working on. Okay? So some things that are important to practice is converting, for example, like English into a math expression. So there could be word problems that we're trying to rewrite as a math expression from English. So for example, we're looking for x is at least 5. So this would be the English version of a, a math expression, right? We're saying that x can be at least 5. So we're saying that x, which is the variable, can take on any value. But the lowest that it can be is 5. So we are to rewrite that. We say, well, x can be greater than or equal to 5, right? The smallest value that it can be in order for it to be a true statement has to be 5 in this case. So that is one good way to symbolize that in a math expression or math inequality here.
then we can have the <clears throat> reverse of it. We can say x is at most three. Right. So x can be any number, but in this situation, we're saying that it can be at most three. Well, the largest number that it can be is three. So x has to be less than or equal to three. And there are different scenarios where perhaps we need more than one inequality to represent the situation we're trying to express. So if we say, you know, x is between 4 and 8. Right, we haven't said anything about being equal to 4, being equal to 8. So the best way that we can represent this would be to say, well, 4. So the variable x is going to be between those two values, where it has to be less than 8, but greater than four, right? That's the only way that it can be <clears throat> between those numbers. So this representation here can prove a little tricky, uh, but if you draw a number line, and since it goes in order, right, from smallest to greatest, then we definitely see four on the left eight on the right, and here is x, right? So you can definitely see how x is larger than four, which is what this representation here tells us, that inequality. But definitely you see that x is less than eight, which is what this inequality here tells us, so. So let's do a couple examples to see what type of problems we can expect from inequalities and things like that. So we want to solve for x. We have 8x minus 11. All of that is less than or equal to 3x minus 13. So that is the inequality that we have. It's not really in the form that I provided at the very beginning, but that's okay. We could make it look like that, right? We, we have the ability to move things around. Like if we were solving an, a regular equation, there is just one extra rule that I'll write here. And it is that if you divide or multiply by a negative number, you will need to I guess we'll say reverse the inequality. If it was less than, it then becomes greater than. If it was greater than or equal to, it becomes less than or equal to. <clears throat> okay, all you have to do is reverse 
the direction of it. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve this. And we're going to start by adding 11 to the other side. Then we're going to take away the 3x from both sides. This becomes 5x is less than 2. So at this point, we haven't multiplied or divided by anything. We've only subtracted and added a number to both sides. All right, that's not considered a multiplication or a division. Now we're going to divide both sides by the number that's in front of the x. So what number is in front of the x? It's the number 5. It's positive. So I'm going to divide both sides by 5. I don't have to flip the inequality. I don't have to do anything because the number is positive. So finally, I have x is less than 2, less than or equal to negative 2 over 5. So that is my solution. However, there's a new way that we need to learn for representing our solution in <clears throat> interval notation. So the first step is to create a number line like this one. Since we only have one number that we are focusing on, which is the negative 2 over 5, I'm going to put it in the middle. And then I want to think for a second, you know, what's on this far right of the number line? If it goes on forever, it goes on towards positive infinity. If it goes all the way to the left, then it's going to go to negative infinity, right? So those are my two endpoints. Now, if I'm looking for values of x that are less than or equal to negative 2 over 5, well, where or what region is that on, right? Where is those numbers. So let's go ahead and kind of highlight that region. So if x is less than negative 2, it's going to be this region right here. Okay. One thing to notice is that this has an equal to symbol. So we're going to put a square bracket here and there's always going to be a parenthesis around infinity, whether positive or negative, because infinity is just a concept. It's not an exact number. Okay, so we put a square bracket around equality or something that is exact number. So we can't put it around um, infinity. So solution in interval notation is going to be from negative infinity all the way up to negative 2 over 5, right? It goes like this, from 2, right? We always read it from left to right. So hopefully that makes sense.
Next example is still going to be a linear equation. It's probably going to be just a little bit more difficult. So we have the following. And we're trying to solve for x. So we want to figure out this inequality. What values of x work that make this true? So we want to think back to the basics when we talked about radical or rational equations, right? So this is a rational inequality because there is like fractions. So we got to think about what are the denominators here? and how we can make this work in our favor, right? We always want to make things easier on ourselves. So if you look at here, we have the denominator six and 12. So how can I reduce that down so it doesn't have any fractions anymore? And so the answer is use the lowest common denominator, right? Or the lowest common factor between 6 and 12, which in this case is going to be 12. So before I write all this again, I'll copy it. <clears throat> and pretend like I'm going to multiply by 12 or multiply everything by 12. So this is what I mean, times 12, times 12, and times 12. So notice how I'm multiplying by a positive number. So I don't have to change the inequality, right? I don't have to reverse it. So six goes to six once, six goes into 12 twice. So this becomes, 2 times 4x minus 3 plus 2 times 12 is 24. This is greater than, and then 12 goes into 12 once, 12 goes into 12 once, and this becomes 2x minus 1. Perfect. So then all we have to do is do a little distribution and organize things a little better. So. 2 times 4x is 8x minus 6 plus 24 greater than or equal to 2x minus 1. Then we can kind of put this together a little better. 8x plus 18 is greater than or equal to 2x minus 1. Then, a couple things, we can move that 18 to the other side, so subtract 18 from both sides, and then also move that 2x to the other side. So we have 6x, and the inequality has not been reversed since we haven't done any multiplication or anything, or any division by a negative number. So this becomes 6x is greater than or equal to negative 19. So we then divide both sides by 6. And I have x is greater than or equal to negative 19 <clears throat> over 6. So do our number line here in the middle is negative 19 over 6. 
And so I'm looking for the values of x that make this inequality true. So here on the right side is positive infinity. On the left is negative infinity. <clears throat> so which values make this true? What numbers are bigger? Are they on the right or are they on the left? And the answer is that they are on the right side. Okay, so my answer is going to be following the from comma to idea is going to be negative 19 over 6 because that's the starting point. It goes all the way up to positive infinity. But since there is an equal symbol in my inequality, then I'm going to use the square bracket. And then on the infinity symbol, I got to use a parenthesis. And that is my solution in interval notation, right? So I guess many things are going on right here. I got the solution in three different forms. I have it here as an inequality, okay? That's a good answer if it was asked as an inequality. Then we have a graphical representation of my solution, right? And then interval notation. So another way that the solution can be represented is that whenever you're dealing with greater than or less than equal, uh, we will use square brackets. But also, when graphing, we're going to use what we call a solid circle. Okay? Perhaps here, you could see in the graphical representation a filled in circle stating that at that point on the number line is where my solution starts. But then, when you're dealing with greater than or less than, we use parentheses and we use an empty circle or hollow circle to represent the starting point on the number line or the solution. Okay, it just means not included, right? So hopefully that makes sense uh, and it gives you a better understanding whenever you're doing the homework and the graphics come up and you're trying to figure out what is the solution that as a graphical representation for that inequality. Okay, so those are uh, linear inequalities, very straightforward. Now let's talk about whenever it is in between two values. So Whenever we have an expression that is bounded by two numbers, then we're going to call this a compound inequality. A compound inequality is an inequality of the following form. So you have a number that is the lower bound, 
and your inequality is either less than or greater than, or it could be equal to, either one. In the middle, there is some kind of linear expression. Okay? And then another inequality. And then you have your upper bound. So A is less than BX plus C less than D. So this is called a compound inequality because it's an inequality that has two bounds. With respect to the previous examples, we didn't have two bounds. Uh, kind of, in, in a way we did. One of them was infinity, but this compound inequality has more of a defined bound, which is gonna be a numerical value, something specific. So one thing to say is that the inequality signs must always point in the same direction. Okay, so <clears throat> one thing to say about this compound inequalities is that they look tricky with their form. So like if you have this, for example, what I want to say is that whenever you're solving them, and you are, for example, solving for x, and you're subtracting this number, you got to do it from three different places, like from the middle portion. And then keep in mind that you have one inequality here and then one inequality here. OK? That seems too um, complicated or just confusing. What you can do is break it up into two inequalities. Notice how you really have bx plus c is less than d. That's one inequality. We solve that by using the same methods that we did on the previous examples. And then also you have a is less than bx plus c. So if you look at it this way, we have two inequalities. They just have in common the linear expression in the middle. OK? So what you're going to do next is if you were to write your solution, you're going to look for where they overlap or in which direction does the inequality point to and then whatever is in common between the two, that's your solution. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and do an example. So we have this inequality, or compound inequality. And 3 is less than or equal to 4x minus 3 less than 19. So it's OK if one of them is equal to and one of them is not equal to. As long as they both point in the same direction, that's all we need. All right. 
So let's do this one <clears throat> separating the two, right? Just so we can see what we're talking about here. So I have three is less than four X minus three. And then we have four X minus three is less than 19. So let's go ahead and solve both of these inequalities. So plus three, then we have six is less than four X. And then divide both sides by four. So six over four is less than or equal to X. Uh, but we can reduce that a little bit. And so it becomes three over two is less than x, perfect. Then on the right side, we're going to add three. So we have four x is less than 22. Then we're gonna divide both sides by four. And we're gonna end up with x is less than 22 over four, and we can simplify that as 11 over two, right? So we have two different solutions that share the same X. So what we want to do is graph both on the same number line. Oops, that's terrible. So let's do straight line here. Perfect. And what we want to do is, <clears throat> I guess, be a little bit smart about the answers that we get and place them correctly. I mean, put the smallest number on the left and the largest number on the right. And if they look strange, like right now they have fractions and you don't know which value is what, uh, put in the calculator and figure out the decimal value. Maybe that makes it easier for you. So 3 over 2 is right here. 11 over 2 is to the right of it. So just as a reminder, on the left we have infinity, and then on the right side we have positive infinity. So we have a solid circle on... 3 over 2, right? And then we have an empty or a not including on, on that 11 over 2. Perfect. So here's another way to figure out where your solution is. So notice how, and sometimes it's beneficial if you write the variable on the left side helps read better. So if you look at this and it looks kind of like an arrow, it's just saying that my solution set points to the right. Right? It says in this direction is where the x values that make the inequality true, that's where they live. Right, so greater than three over two, well, to the right of it. Then we have the solution set for 11 over two is the values less than. So those live in that direction. Notice that they both point in opposite directions. One of them goes towards negative infinity. One of them goes to positive infinity. What we care about is where they overlap, and it happens here, right? So my solution set is only from 3 over 2 to 11 over 2 in parentheses, okay? So it's important to understand how compound inequalities work and how to solve them, right? You gotta have 
a plan. You gotta have a method to do it. And if you do it this way, uh, just be on the lookout for whenever you get to the bottom of your solution. One of them is going to have the variable on the right side, while the other one is going to have it on the left. And that's gonna make reading the solution or the inequality a little bit tricky. And that's why I went from the right side to putting it on the left side so that I can read it better. Okay? Let's do another example. Okay. In this case, I'm not going to split it up into two inequalities. I'm just going to solve it in one inequality or in one go. Okay, so I want the x by itself. That's always the, the goal. So I'm going to add 1. And like I said before, I have to add it to three different places, uh, mainly the middle portion because I'm going to cancel. So that is just a good habit to show your work. Right? So then I have negative 11 plus 1. That becomes negative 10 less than 2x, less than negative 4, right? Then I still want x by itself, so I'm going to do division, right? Divide by 2 on everything. The 2 goes away here. So I have negative 10 over 2, which becomes 5, less than x, less than or equal to negative 2. So you could argue that this method is quicker or this way of solving is quicker. Uh, then we're not done. We still have to either graph our solution or write it out in interval notation. So here is negative 5 and here is negative 2. So remember, on the left side is negative infinity, on the right side is positive infinity. So numbers get larger as you go from left to right. Then at negative 5, we have a greater than symbol, which means it's not solid. It's just an empty, not including circle. And at negative 2, we have a filled in solid circle. Okay, <clears throat> and I'm looking for the solution set, and it's kind of simple to see here that x is in between those two values, right? So this must be my solution set, right? x is less than negative 2, but x is greater than negative 5. So if I was to write this, in interval notation, my solution set would be this. Parentheses, negative 5, comma 2, square bracket. Okay? So, that is all 1.7 of inequalities and really just an extension of how to solve linear equations 
In this case, we're switching it over to having a bunch of solutions, right? Because it could go all the way up to infinity in some cases, and that means that we have infinitely many solutions thanks to the inequalities. So now that we know or have seen inequalities, we're going to talk about polynomial inequalities. So inequalities that include something larger than a linear expression. Okay, so polynomial inequalities. is a inequality. that has the following form of uh, greater than zero, P less than zero, P is greater than or equal to zero, or P is less than or equal to zero, right? <clears throat> Where P is a polynomial. So, this is just a very, very generic definition. I mean, it covers all of the different cases, right, where it's greater, less, greater than, equal to, or less than or equal to, and it's just an inequality, I'm sorry, a polynomial. So if we don't know or if we don't remember what a polynomial is, I'll give you an example of polynomials, right? You can say x, right? x is a polynomial, so x greater than 0, x plus 1 greater than 0. Now, this is pretty much everything we saw in 1.7, right? These are all linear polynomials because x has power 1. But what about this? x squared greater than 0, 2x squared plus 1 less than 0. Uh, and it can go on forever. We could say x plus 1 times x plus 2 times x plus 3 greater than 0. Right? Those are just some examples of what a polynomial is. All of these guys on the left of the, e of the inequality are polynomials. Okay, they're just different representations of polynomials. So things like that is what we can expect to see uh, in a polynomial inequality. So, what can we expect in terms of a problem, right? 
we could have anything from what we've seen before, as a bunch of quadratics and things like that. Now, how to solve it, that's going to be the real deal, right? That's the hardest part. How do we solve these inequalities? So, first we want them to be greater than or less than zero. That zero portion is very important. Okay, so step one, pretty much solve P equals zero. So we'll go from an inequality to an equation, right? You want to go and rewrite it. So if we did, we have x squared minus 2x minus 8 <coughs> equals 0. So only do this step if necessary, right? This is only to help you kind of visualize things. It doesn't change anything. The solution is going to be the same, but this is more about helping you wrap your mind around the process and the solution, right? Because we know how to do this now. We've done this before. Anything equals zero, especially if it's a quadratic, should seem kind of easy. So two things, right? Either we can factor or we can use quadratic formula. So if anything, I'm going to factor, right? So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply up to 8 and add up to negative 2. So perhaps 2 and 4, 2 and negative 2, I'm sorry, 4 and negative 2, or just any combination of that. Those two numbers add up to negative 2, negative 4 plus 2, is negative 2. When you multiply them, they give you negative 8. So that's one way to do it. Or just do quadratic formula. From here, I'm going to use the zero product property, where since their product gives me 0, they must be equal to 0 at some point individually. Right, and I just have to solve for x. Now, these values that I just got here, these are going to be called boundary values. Okay, they're going to be boundary values on the number line. I'm going to make a number line. So the way we solve this problem is going to be a little bit different than the previous inequalities. Because here we have points at which it equals 0. So here's negative 2. Here's positive 4. So we're going to look and choose for a number that is to the left of that boundary value. Then there's going to be a number in mean in this region. And then we're going to pick another number to the right side. So step number one was to solve p equals 0. Step number two would have been to plot the boundary values, OK?
Step number three, I'm going to write up here, will be to choose and test. Well, how about I just take it one step at a time? We're going to choose test values. Right, and those test values is what I just mentioned that you have to pick a number uh, to the left of the boundary value in the middle and then to the right. So we'll say x equals negative 3, which is to the left, which is right here. I'm going to choose the easiest one, which is x equals 0. Always choose the easiest values. And then x equals 5. So I'm going to choose those test values. Step number four will be to test the values. Right? So once we do that, once we have decided what values we want to use, this is where it gets a little bit time consuming, um, maybe a little. So if I do x equals negative 3, so I'm going to say negative 3 squared minus 2 times negative 3 minus 8. And I am wondering, is that greater than 0? So I simplify this to 9 minus, I'm sorry, 9 plus 6 minus 8. Is that greater than 0? And, and you don't have to solve it all the way. If you notice here that these two numbers give me something like 14, I'm sorry, 15. And when I take away 8, I still get a positive number. So whatever I get here is, in fact, larger than 0. So I'm going to put a little check mark, meaning that test value speaks for the whole region. And all of that, it's true. It's going to work. OK? Then test value number 2, x equals 0. So 0 squared minus 2 times 0, well, not squared here, minus 8. Is that greater than 0? So I, uh, I got 0 minus 0 minus 8. Is that greater than 0? So 0 minus 0 goes away, and you're just looking at negative 8. Is negative 8 greater than 0? And the answer is no, right? A negative number is not bigger than 0. So we put an x here, meaning that the region in between doesn't work, doesn't give me a true statement. Then we test the last value, which is 5. So 5 squared minus 2 times 5 minus 8. And I'm wondering. Is that greater than 0? So 25 minus 10 minus 8. Is all of that greater than 0? <clears throat> and again, I don't care about the answer. I just want to look at the statement and see if it gives me a true statement or not. So this combines to negative 18. 25 minus 18 it's still going to give me a bigger number than 0 or a positive number. So this works. And this region here works. The final step is to gather the regions that work. Notice how I have 
two regions that work, uh, but there's a break in between, right? There's like a, a piece that doesn't work. So we're going to finalize our solution here as a interval. So from negative infinity all the way up to negative two, not including it because it is a solid circle at both, right? This is from the original. It's greater than, it doesn't have an equality symbol, so I'm not going to include it. So parentheses. Now, what you want to do is write this symbol U, which is like a cup. It's saying that it's in union or in unison with the other interval that starts at four and it goes all the way up to positive infinity. Okay? So it's saying the interval from negative infinity all the way up to negative two and in union with the interval that goes from four to positive infinity represent my full solution set. And that's all that it means. And that would be my solution. Okay. So these are the steps to solving one of these types of problems. Polynomial inequalities. They're all going to be the same way as this. Some of them are going to be less than, and you could potentially just have one region that you get as your solution set. And in that case, you would have just one interval. Okay. All right. Next, I'm going to talk about rational inequalities. So it's important to remember what a rational expression is, just in general. So a rational has the following form, right? It's just a fraction and you have a polynomial on the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. So in this case, just like before, we have a greater than or less than, greater than or equal to or less than or equal to zero. Okay, we want to most of the time or every time have it greater than or less than zero, right? Just zero in one side and then the rational expression on the other side. So this is very much the same as the previous example or the previous type. Uh, with one difference. What you want to do, perhaps as a first step to solving this type of problems, is like I said, to express the inequality as one inequality, right?
with a zero on one side. Okay, so second step would be to find the boundary points the boundary values and you do that by the numerator and the denominator equal to zero Okay, so you want to set whatever is in the numerator equals to zero, whatever is in the denominator equal to zero. Hopefully this kind of starts looking like the previous example. Then want to choose test values evaluate test values and Finally, we want to write our solution in interval notation. Right, so first of, you know, same process as before, we want to express the inequality so that one side is zero and the other one has the full inequality. Then we want to find some boundary values by setting the numerator and the denominator accordingly to zero. Then, I guess I didn't say that there, but we want to solve both the numerator and the denominator. Right? We want to find the values of x that make the numerator and the denominator equal to zero. Step three will be to choose some test values. Step four plug in those test values or evaluate them. And then whatever part be true, that's going to be our solution set. So let's do a couple of examples. So x plus 5 over x minus 2 greater than 0. So in this case, it's already set up in some way, <clears throat> right? All the expression is all by itself in one side, and it's greater than 0, equal to 0. The 0 is already by itself, OK? So what we want to do is separately solve for x in the numerator and in the denominator. So x plus 5 equals 0, x minus 2 equals to 0. So solve for x. x is equals to negative 5 
x is equals to 2. Right? What is this that I just found? Is that the solution? Uh, not really. Right? These are the boundary values. Okay, so I'm going to create a number line. Okay, and negative 5 is going to be on the left, positive 2 on the right side. <clears throat> Remember, negative infinity and positive infinity are at both ends of my number line. So those are my two boundary values. And so my region is kind of broken into three regions here again, right? Now my next step will be to figure out some test values. something to the left of negative 5, so x equals negative 6, perfect. x equals 0, my favorite because it's one of the easiest numbers to compute. And then something to the right of positive 2, which will be x equals 3. Okay, so those are my test values. Next, I am going to evaluate those test values. All right, so what does that mean? That just means plug them in and see what we get. So negative 6 plus 5 over negative 6 minus 2. I am wondering, is that greater than 0? So I end up with negative 1 over negative 8. And is that greater than 0? So be on the lookout for things like this, right? Uh, first of all, make sure you add and subtract correctly, because that's the first mistake that we could encounter. Then division, right? That's the second mistake that we could encounter. So this really is 1 over 8. A negative number over a negative number is a positive, And that works. That comes out to be true, right? So. Negative 6 works. Uh, what about 0? <clears throat> so 0 plus 5 over 0 minus 2. Is that greater than 0? And so 5 over negative 2. Is that larger than 0? Is that greater than 0? And the answer is no, right? This is not true because it comes out to be a negative number. So this doesn't work. I think I'm running out of room here, but what about 3? 3 plus 5 over 3 minus 2. Is that greater than 0? So we got 8 over 1. Is that greater than 0? And that is true. So. Three regions, two of them work, and in this case, we're doing the same thing as before. So all the way from negative infinity up to positive, I'm sorry, negative 5. And then um, adding it or in union with this other set of numbers makes up my final solution. Okay, so something to look out for is if this right here would have been greater than or equal to. What if we had that equality symbol? So look out for whenever that equality symbol exists. We're saying that there could be a number that equals zero. Well, that number can only come from the numerator. We cannot divide by zero. So 
at time, can the denominator be equal to zero? Uh, we do that here and we look for the boundary value. That is okay. That just gives us an, an idea as to what number to avoid. So if this would have been equal to, like I'm saying here, my solution, the interval would have been this, negative infinity up to negative five, including it because it is okay if I plug in negative five because I go from, uh, you know, if I plug in negative five here, this would be zero divided by whatever number, and that gives me zero, and that's okay. Zero equal to zero, that works. However, I cannot include positive two because a number divided by zero does not equal zero. It just doesn't exist. It's undefined. So one of my two would have been parentheses. The other one would have been a square bracket. So this would have been the square bracket, but this one would have been a parentheses if this would have been equal to, okay? So just an example that is very important that you need to know if that was the case, but it wasn't the case. But I don't want to confuse you, but at the same time, I want to give you a good example. All right, and that is everything that I have for today.